This masterclass series has been produced by Deliberately Engaging in support of the UN's Sustainable Development Goals to build the institutions of civil society and empower people with a greater voice. Hello and welcome to this podcast. I'm Ed Davis. I'm the moderator for this masterclass series for activists on the union movement's history of struggle and achievements. The series draws on the wisdom and experience of Tom MacDonald, former vice president of the ACTU and former national secretary of the Building Workers Industrial Union since 1992, a part of the Construction, Forestry, Maritime, Mining and Energy Union. Current and former trade union leaders will join Tom and I during the series. Today, we're very pleased to have two guests with us, Sally McManus, Secretary of the ACTU since 2017. She was formerly New South Wales Secretary of the Australian Services Union. And Bill Kelty, Secretary of the ACTU from 1983 to the year 2000. Welcome Sally, Bill and Tom. Today's podcast will focus on the power of strategic thinking and planning in mounting winning campaigns. We'll explore the role that tactics play as stepping stones to achieving success. I'll be asking our three discussants to explain key components and strategy and to look at how leaders apply strategic thinking in practice. Tom, what is strategy and why is strategic thinking and planning important? Ed, I don't think you can win a major struggle against a formidable opponent unless you have a strategy based on strategical planning, based on strategical thinking. I wanted to say a few words about the theory of strategy, and I wanted to start off by quoting San Su, and he said, strategy without tactics is the slow road to victory. Tactics without strategy is a noise before the defeat. I agree. I liken it to someone getting on a merry-go-round. Get on a merry-go-round, you go around and around and around. You travel a fair distance. When you get off the merry-go-round, you've in fact gone nowhere. You've achieved nothing. So I think in every campaign, you have one strategy because you have one objective. You have different tactics that take you step by step to building power that you need to win. Step one is to unite the workers. Step two is to build solidarity. Your tactics seek to maximize your strengths, minimize your weaknesses, and do the reverse to your opponents. The power of third parties has to be factored into your strategy such as courts, governments, the media, people's power, because those parties may have a self-interest in the issue or in the outcome, and you need to, looking at their history, to decide what tactics you're going to use to move them to a better position. Your opponents will also have a strategy, And you have to factor that into your strategy. And again, history tells you how they're likely to behave. And your strategy includes a plan to defeat their strategy. That, in my view, is the the essence of thinking about strategy and tactics. Sally, can you give us an example of how you've used strategic thinking and planning in some of the campaigns that you've been involved in? Yeah, thanks, Ed. I'd like to talk about a campaign we ran when I was at the ASU for equal pay for community and disability workers. So they're workers in the non-government community sector. And our aim was to win equal pay. So effectively, a pay rise that took into account that these workers' jobs and their work had been undervaluated because it was a feminized and is a feminized industry. So we knew what we wanted. The question was, how are we going to get there? And so in terms of strategic thinking, the first thing, of course, to do is to analyze your situation. 
And there's many ways to do that and dif different methodologies, but the simplest one, of course, is just to look at your own strengths and weaknesses and look at the strengths and weaknesses of who you have to influence. And out of that, you can develop your strategy. So for us, our strengths as a union were that we had a group of workers that had the potential to get public support, there to be public sympathy for their argument. We also had a strength in that there was a Labor government at the time, so that there was a uh, opportunity really because of that. But we also knew we had many weaknesses at the beginning of this campaign. One of them was the ability to unite the workers when most of them were working in very small workplaces. A lack of belief amongst the, the workers that they could actually win employer opposition as well, and also a lack of visibility. So a lot of the public didn't even know what these workers did or who they were. So that was our own analysis of our situation. And we did the same with the two people we had to influence. One was the government, because in the end, they were going to have to pay for these pay increases. And secondly, it was the employers, because we really needed to neutralise them in order to win as well. So Overall, our overall strategy was to build enough public support for our claim because we knew that would influence the government. It would also have some influence on employers. At the same time, we had to neutralise the opposition of employers. So once we knew that that was our overall strategy, that was something that obviously would be discussed with members and talked about with members. And then whenever we were then analysing or making decisions about tactics, like what we would do along the way to getting where do we wanted to go, it had to relate back to the overall strategy. It had to add to or strengthen our ability to go to where we wanted to go. And that campaign went over eight years. And so over that time, the overall strategy didn't really change. What did change all the time were the tactics. So, Sally, what you and Tom have both highlighted is the importance of having a very clear goal about what you want to achieve, careful analysis of the situation and your strengths and weaknesses, and those of other parties, such as employers and governments. But I think what's great about your example is that it reminds us of the importance of strategic planning for the long term. As you said, yours was a campaign that took eight years to win. Well, that's right. I mean, Tom and, and Bill would have examples of ones that it went even you know, longer. I'm reminded that both of those who were involved in these that, for example, the movement against apartheid didn't start with massive mobilisations. It would have started with a, a couple of people in a room probably. And what are we talking about? We're talking about decades. Bill, how did you use strategic planning and thinking in the campaigns you designed? Perhaps we can ask you about the campaign to win industry-based super for all workers. Well, I think as Sally and Tom have said, the starting point is your belief system, what you're campaigning for, the objective. And you've got to have what you campaign for put in terms of what you believe in. And if you can't get that done at the outset, then it's very difficult to win. For example, in terms of superannuation, our view was this country needs very big safety nets in terms of health care, in terms of the wages system, education and retirement benefits. So this was one of the pillars of a society with decent safety nets. So it was never a contest between which pillar was more important than the other. Right from the outset, it had to be one of the key pillars for our society. Now, once you've got your belief system established and where it sits in terms of your argument, the second thing is decide of what route you want to go to try to achieve that objective. You can take a view that, for example, superannuation is best pursued politically. Now, that was the early days, once a few breakthroughs went through, people thought that the best way was to, with the Whitlam government, proceed to get national superannuation through a report by Hancock and get a political outcome. There's another way which the United States unions pursue is it's essentially a relationship between employers and employees, so it can just simply be industrial. In Australia, we don't have that view. The unions have never had either of those extreme views. They've essentially been organisations with a well-established track record of proceeding industrially and politically. That is, it seems to establish its objective industrially and politically. So then you decide that 
the second way we're going to go is we're going to pursue this claim industrially and politically. And we're not going to proceed with the claim politically before we've achieved it industrially. So that was a very important set of decisions. So we were never really involved in the Hancock inquiry and all that. We thought that was a game that was, would distract us from ultimately winning what we had to do. Now, once you've determined to proceed industrially and politically, but industrially first, you've got to be able to explain to workers why you want it and why it's important for them. And it's a very simple proposition. It is for them ensuring that when they retire, they have more money, more options, and a dignified retirement in an ageing population. Now, that's the essential proposition you have to convince them of, and that's important in terms of it. You then have to answer all the questions that they will raise. Is it the existing system, the system that was then? No, it's not that system. It is not deferred pay in a narrow sense, which is vested in employers. Employers will not control this money. Will the tax advantage which existed for superannuation at that time be the same? No, they won't. Taxation will actually be higher, but there will be a tax benefit. Will it destroy the pension system? No, we will not destroy the pension system. So you had to have a very clear view as to the sort of system you would have. Will it won't be controlled by employers? And will it be controlled by unions? It will not be controlled by unions. That is, it's a new democratic form of control. Now, once that is done, the leadership then becomes very important. Once you've determined the strategy, which is not determined by one person but a group of people, you've got to then be able to convince the union leaders that this is not a right-wing thing or a left-wing thing or an opportunist thing. This is actually a union claim. So you're going to sit down with the right-wing union leaders and the left-wing union leaders and say, within the terms of what we're campaigning for, is there substantial agreement? Is this worthwhile pursuing? because I think we can pursue it and win it. So then got to convince people how you are going to win it and how we are collectively going to win it. And we're going to win it as a way we've won most claims is making it industrial, putting a claim on employers, convincing workers to go on strike for it, convincing workers to fight for it, convincing workers to want it. And from that industrial position, we will then create a political response. So we had to be able to convince people that we're prepared to fight for it. Now, how are we going to fight for it? You then outline what the strategy is and and what our tactical position will be. We will proceed with the building industry, we will then go to the metal industry, we will then go to the transport industry. And we will establish a gain of 3% knowing that is not the objective, but it has established for us the beachhead for the objective. So you set about to undertake that strategy. Then you build up political support. Politicians then got confronted with a, an industrial fait accompli that we are going to proceed with that industrially and workers want it and will support us and we will take action and we will be really strong. Then you'll get a political reaction. And what you want is political support. In the case of superannuation, we're very, very lucky because you didn't get just mere political support. You got a champion for superannuation in Paul Keating who didn't see it as being foisted upon him but believed in it. So you had to do all of those things. And the only other thing you then had to do as you established the 3% moved it to 6%, you had to have plan A and plan B. That is, we would always take it to the every accord, take it to the electorate, have it incorporated, and if Labor Party win, they would implement it. But if the Commission rejected it, as we thought they might, you had to have another plan, plan B, and that is to legislate for it. So every step, you've got to have an alternative as you implement what is a very significant safety net for the country. But strategy starts with believing things and owning them. Very hard to have a strategy about things if you don't believe. Tom, you were, you were in the thick of this struggle. What was the experience for you in the BWIU? The building industry played a part in achieving universal superannuation based on industry funds. I want to talk about the tactics that we use and add on to what Bill says, but I think in a big campaign, you can't win it with limited tactics. You have to have a range of tactics because you have to go through stages to get to winning your goal. So I I just want to outline the stages as I saw it. Bill played the leadership role, central leadership role, 
I come in a, a bit later when the building industry got involved. So I just run through these steps as I said. Stage one, superannuation was a vision. It was born out of the collective wisdom of a handful of ACTU officials led by Bill Kelty. Stage two, the tactic was to unite the trade union movement and the Labor government in support of the vision. Stage three, the tactic was to win the hearts and minds of workers and unite working people. This involved creating a radically new system of superannuation based on Labor working class values and throwing the elite systems, retail systems, into the garbage bin. The next stage was to set up an industry scheme in a casual industry like the building industry. That was successful after struggle, and this scheme is now known as CBUS. Stage five, the tactic was to set up in other industry schemes modelled on CBUS in those industries where unions had the power to win. The tactic was to have the same scheme in every industry so that into the future they could unite together because they were all part of one system. The next stage was to have award superannuation established as a right where previously superannuation was a privilege only for the elite of, of the workforce. After that was successful, the tactic was to have the 3% superannuation scheme that Bill spoke about increase to 6%. When that tactic failed, a new tactic was to reach an agreement with the Hawke-Keating Labor government to legislate phase in 9% superannuation and over time with the Rudd government to 12%. This phasing in was undermined by the Abbott government. Many other tactics were used. They all contributed to our final victory. I think an important tactic was how we won over powerful sections of the employers, and that was being prepared to agree they have equal representatives to the unions on the boards of management of these schemes. That finally won over sections of employers when they could see the benefits to the economy of industry-based superannuation, which plays an enormous part in our economy today. And as a result, those who were ideologically opposed to superannuation because they believed it was socialism by the back door, they were effectively isolated and they remain isolated and they remain incapable of changing the position because the workers now have ownership of their superannuation and no bastard's going to take it off them. Yes, Sally, uh, you'd like to comment? Well, I think there's an important common thing that both of them are talking about and that's the importance of getting not just unity around what a strategy is but around stress testing that really. And when you think about, okay, what does that mean if you're a workplace activist or if you're a delegate, what does that mean? Well, it means that you should be able to articulate what the strategy is. So, you should be able to explain in a straightforward way, the way we're going to get to A to B is by doing this. And then to involve mm. uh, workers in that discussion. And so, you should be able to then stress test it. So, a whole lot of your work colleagues will say, well, hang on a minute, that's not going to work because of this reason mm. or that reason. And if you haven't already thought through that, those workers are going to really mm. make that strategy much sharper and pick up all the things that the smaller group of activists uh, may have missed out on. So, by the time it's been through, as unions, been democratic organisations and been about workers banding together, it is, it's about winning workers o over to a plan, but also making the plan itself a strong one. So, uh, involving people in the development of that strategy is always going to make it stronger. Bill had the 
the honour of working with people like Tom and a whole lot of other union leaders that were all highly experienced strategic thinkers in a workplace. You may not have the luxury of having that, but you'd have the luxury of having your other workmates who can always pick holes in, in an idea that you've come up with in terms of a strategy and that will help. And then in the end, if everyone can simply repeat, this is the way we're going to win this pay rise or this is the way we're going to fix this roster, you know that people have learnt how to think strategically themselves because they've thought through okay, why are we doing this? But also means that there'll be strong buy-in for where you're going. Before we came on air, Tom, you were talking with me about how important the democratic participation of the workers was uh, in the whole process. Well, I think in the decision-making process, there has to be a method of ensuring that the leadership takes into account the thinking and attitude of the workers Based on that, you decide your tactics, whether you've got to go through further education processes, for example, or whether you can move to more positive action from where you are. But you have to be making your tactics based on the position of the employers and government and also on the position of the workers, because the workers in the final sense have to win it through militant action and make the breakthrough, and then other tactics can be used to spread it through the award system and then through legislation by Labor governments to the whole workforce. So it's a matter of democratically decided strategies and tactics is critical in ensuring the unity of the leadership and the unity of the workers. Bill, getting good at strategy isn't an easy process. You've got to be good at looking ahead, clarifying goals, taking people with you, uh, and much more. How did you get good at being a strategist? If you go back to superannuation, that issue, this is two points. One that Sally raised and one that Tom raised are very important. You're never good at anything unless you believe in it. It's, it's not a chess game that you just move pieces around the board and say, are oh, you good at moving the pieces around the board? Uh, it is about winning the game. So there's two points that are very relevant in terms of history of superannuation. See, Charlie Fitzgibbon won superannuation following the coal miners in the late 40s. Then it went on to the maritime union and then it went on to the pulp and paper industry and the storemen and packers and the meat workers. They're all strong unions who could have said to us, well, we already have superannuation and we're not prepared to fight for everybody to get superannuation. Now, in the United States, when I was there in the late 70s, when we were talking about superannuation, they thought our strategy was absolutely crazy. They thought this is a communist strategy. They thought we were communists. An idea that you would use industrial muscle to get everybody superannuation was just unbelievable. They said that Simon Crean and I were perhaps the most dangerous union officials. But in Australia, we did not have that response. We had the opposite response. We had the waterside workers, the seamen union, the meat workers, every one of the unions which had already won it, all the strong unions saying it is only right that everybody gets it. So we had that level of leadership and commitment. So whenever people personalise any of these things, then they are never capable of being personalised. I would have lasted one meeting without the support of those union leaders. I would have lasted less than an hour if they had have said, this is for us to win and if we're not winning it for everybody else. We had a very special group of people who were committed to win it for everybody. The second thing that Tom raised is very, very important. You had to divide the employers. Now, you divide the employers most of the time by saying, here is a benefit and a cost. Now, the benefit for you for this will be Australians actually will be better off with a better superannuation retirement system. That's a good thing for a nation. And you will be better off because the cost of your capital will be lower. You will not have defined benefit funds which cripple you in times of emergency. You'll be involved in this. The balance of payments will, will go into a surplus in terms of the current account. That is, we will change the economic structure of the economy to your benefit as well as to ours. Now, you don't have to win them all, but you have to win some. And as soon as you win a significant number of employers on your side, you say, well, that argument is actually right, then you've probably broken the back. But it requires both of those things. It requires both of those things. You must always divide your opposition because it's very hard 
to just thrash out a victory. It's almost impossible. Tom, you've got your hand up. What, what do you want to say? I wanted to uh, say the difference between the Australian trade unions movement strategy and the American union movement strategy is told in a story that Bill Kelty told me when he came back from America. It was in a city in America, I think it might have been New York. It was walking up the street to go to the union headquarters and there was a number of people with signs around their, their necks begging for money so they could go to hospital and have an operation. And Bill went up to the union office and said to an official, what are you doing about these workers? And they said, nothing, they're not our members. So the American movement was based on winning gains for their members in the various industries where they had the power, where we were based on a class approach that we valued and cared about every worker. So whether they were a unionist or a, or a non-unionist, we cared about them and their families. So we always campaign on a class basis, not just a union benefit basis, so that when they tried to undermine our conditions of employment to work choices, what happened is not only did workers vote against them in the elections, but other workers not in the union voted against it, and they united together because they both were being attacked because we achieved it for everyone. Everyone was prepared to stand in defence of it, and I think that had a big effect in winning the struggle against work choices. I think that goes back to Sally's point about the importance of winning, winning hearts and minds. But it's also because, Tom, and the same with Bill, you've had a lot of practice. So, yes, about understanding the theory and, secondly, understanding how power works. And then it's having a go, isn't it? It's doing things and living through it and having campaigns that you do over and over again. You just get better at it. Tom, I think the question you raised about how do you develop your skills in the area of strategy? Yeah. I think one of the steps is to understand the theory of strategy. And the second step is to understand the central role of power and where that power comes from. Once you understand the fundamentals, it's not hard if you've got a democratic approach to your decisions you're going to make to develop a good strategy. If you go through those processes, and the experience gained and learning from your mentors, you will become very capable in the development strategy. That's my personal opinion. From day one, I didn't have a clue about strategy. Now, I think, maybe no one else agrees, I've got some strong views about what is strategy and tactics. Sometimes it seems to me that people use the term strategy and tactics almost interchangeably. Tom, can you help us on this one? How do you differentiate strategy from tactics? I look at something in the knowledge, there's only one strategy. So I don't think there can be a dozen strategies. There's one strategy. So when people talk about a campaign and talk about nine or ten strategies, I think they don't understand the difference. Strategy is about building the power to win. Tactics are about the stepping stones that lead you to building the power to win. Back in the early 1980s, the old age pension gave workers no more than a survival income in retirement. There was a class struggle, the working class wanting superannuation for all, the employee in class wanting only superannuation for the elite. They wanted to maintain an injustice and workers wanted to get rid of an injustice. Union leaders decided they would end this injustice by creating industry-based superannuation for all workers. That became their strategical objective. So it starts with a vision. It then becomes a strategic objective. To realise the strategic objective, you need a strategical plan that step by step takes you to building the power to win, in this case, superannuation for all. The strategy was to 
build the power needed to win, and that required us to go through a number of stages of building the power. Our plan was to make the breakthrough in an industry where we had more power than the employers. Our assessment was right, and we made the breakthrough, and that inspired workers in other industries to do the same. So if different unions had different strategies, we couldn't win. But if there was one strategy for all unions, that gave us the unity, the solidarity, and gave workers a sense of power because they saw themselves as part of one struggle. One struggle, one strategy, one strategy achieved through many tactics. So Sally, when you're pursuing a strategy, how do you work out the tactics that are most likely to bring success? So go back to your original strategic analysis of the situation. So remember how I said one of our weaknesses was having small workplaces. Well, the tactics we developed were tactics that understood that but sought to overcome the problem of that. And the problem was People didn't get that automatic sense of power of the collective when there's only two or three of you. So how do we overcome that? The way that we did that is that we did organize big rallies. And in the build up to those big rallies, we asked the workers in those small workplaces to practice this dance that we were all going to do when we got to this big rally. And so you had workers, three of them, in their staff meeting practicing this equal pay dance. And you did have this feeling of, you know, and lots of people were laughing about it and they were taking videos of it and sharing the videos of, you know, two or three of them practicing this dance. Everyone had a bit of a laugh. But then the day we had the rally, and this was all designed, these tactics were designed to really build that sense of union power. People went from that small, slightly embarrassing uh, thing of doing in their workplaces to this day where all of a sudden there was 5,000 people rather than three people who'd all been practicing by themselves this dance with two or three of them, doing it in a mass way with everyone, which quite suited our workforce because it was 85% women. The whole dancing thing was, was an idea that came up from the members. It would be different if it was another group of members, but uh, for this group of members, it was something that was very popular. And all of a sudden, you had this mass activity that everyone had been practicing for a month that everyone did together. And I can't tell you, even though it was a small tactic, the feeling for all of those people who participated in that after that time of doing it by themselves, all of a sudden to do it together was an amplification of that feeling of union or strength in numbers. So these were tactics we developed to overcome that weakness. The second example it goes to the point that has been made by both Tom and Bill about dividing the employers. So we knew we needed to neutralize or get on side a whole lot of our employers. Now, a whole lot of our employers were at charities and they would all say they have certain values. So for example, some of those charities say they believe in equality, they believe in fairness. So we then went on a campaign Campaign. The members went on a campaign about targeting the key employers in the industry saying, well, you say you believe in equality and fairness. Well, how can you not support equal pay? And of course, it really hurt those employers when you questioned their commitment to their core values. So that was a very effective tactic in terms of getting to a position of neutralizing a whole lot of employers and in fact getting quite a lot of them on side. So your dancing tactics would have been powerful in terms of winning the hearts and minds of members, but presumably also very powerful in communicating the message to the community through the media. Well, no one expected a union rally where there was going to be a mass mass dancing. So uh, they're used to sort of hard hats and uh, megaphones. So that did help in terms of media, absolutely. So that was part of uh, the thinking of it, of course. We were trying to build union. We were trying to build a sense of who our union was and we wanted to encourage people to join. We wanted people to go to an event have that feeling of union and go back to their workplaces and talk about it, about how great it was. So these were tactics that were were leading towards, you know, wanting to build up the numbers as well. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I'd like to ask each of you to share with our activists listening to this episode the key learnings you think they should take from our discussion so that that they understand the importance of strategy, what it is, and the importance of tactics and, and what tactics are. 
The most important thing of strategy is to be a believer. Have a set of ideals of which you believe. And when you believe in things and you set yourself objectives to achieve, you try to win. It's not much fun losing, so try to win. And when you try to win, you prepare yourself to win. You do not prepare yourself to lose. You prepare yourself to win. So you get the best case and you understand the opposition case. You plan to be persuasive and you are an advocate for a position that you believe you are not just an advocate. You believe something and you're trying to persuade people. Get people to understand that there's a set of decisions that they may have to make to win and there's a time scale to win and there are tactics that you might have to adopt short term that they may not understand but they are for a tactical reason in order to achieve a result. So you've got to get a high level of trust. If people trust you, if you can go along to the workforce and say, the reason we are returning to work is for this reason in this industry, but trust us because we've got the following campaign. And if they believe you knew and they trust you, then they will do it. So generating a high level of trust and understanding and belief is what you're about. They must be convinced. Working people are not silly. They must be convinced that you can win for them. They don't have to like you, but they have to trust that you are going to win for them. And when you say you need to make these set of decisions, you plan out the dispute, you plan out the cost, and you don't essentially deviate from your strategy. You can change your tactics to achieve it, but you must be committed. And sometimes the most important thing is never let it be personal. It is not about at you as a person, it's not about your standing, it's not about whether people like you or dislike you or what the press say about you or they don't say about you. The most important thing is that they trust you. And if they trust you, if the polls show that it's an unpopular thing to do, if the polls show that you're going to lose, if the editorials of the newspaper say that you're half crazy, it doesn't matter if they trust that you're going to win. And, and when you get those elements together, and when people trust that you're going to win and you deliver a victory for them or a better result for them, then that gives you more confidence. This is no easy game. Bargaining is no easy game. Getting big achievements is no easy game. But that's what you're there for. That's in essence what you're there for. You're there to plan and get a collective response. The reason we won nearly everything we went for is we had every key union committed and on-site. And it was never personal, it was always collective. And the reason we won is we had collective union support. And you have to say it, when people stand in your way and opposition stand in your way internally, you can be nice to them, but essentially you have to beat them. And it's not about being nice all the time. It is not about being popular all the time, it's being really determined to get a result and sometimes, even within your own ranks, you can't be too polite. You just simply can't be too polite. But believing things, fighting for them, assuading people, being tactical, being tough, being determined is what you're there for to get a result. But never, ever let the personality get in the way. Don't even let yourself get in the way. Don't read the editorials about you. Don't read the press because none of it really matters too much. You're only there in history to get the result. And you know this in history, that the result, if it's any good, will last a lot, lot, lot longer than you. Thank you for that, Bill. There's an enormous amount in that. Belief, trust, understanding, not taking things personally, getting collective support and being tough to get the win. Sally? The only thing I'd say is that sometimes when you're executing a tactic, people will say, well, how is this going to achieve what we want to achieve? So, for example, you might be having a rally and people will say, oh, that's a waste of time. It's a waste of time because government won't just agree to something because we're having a rally. Well, you probably haven't done a good job of explaining the overall strategy if people are thinking that they're going to win by just coming to a rally or if they think they're going to win by just signing a petition. These days with technology, there's so many more tactics available and a whole lot that are all being put out all the time. You know, just share this on social media. In the end, it's about power and how you're going to shift power 
And those might all be little building blocks to it, not an end in itself. And so that's the problem when people confuse the tactics and strategy. So, again, key ingredients are involving and engaging with members and the central role of belief is critical to winning. Tom, would you like to share your, your takeaway messages? Yeah, well, I want to make three points. I would say to an activist, if you're engaged in negotiations with an employer around an enterprise bargaining agreement and they are playing funny buggers, you immediately go to principle and come back and say to the employer, well, look, we've got a wage claim in. Do you agree in principle that there should be a wage increase? So you asked a question where they can't avoid giving you a principle answer. Secondly, if they still play funny games during the negotiations, you go to your values, which includes family interest and a fair go for everyone to answer their arguments. And thirdly, you make it sure to the employer that any conflict is not a conflict between you personally and the employer, but it's a conflict between the employer and their employees. And if they don't resolve it, they'll have to suffer the consequences. The second point I want to make is that activists need to understand the need to deal with the big picture. Workers' interests can't be fully protected or advanced solely through negotiation at the enterprise. Certain issues concerning the well-being of workers are political issues. So the workers have got to understand having strong organisation at the workplace is not enough to secure their future. What they need to do have a strong union movement and therefore they should support all of the campaigns of the ACTU, including Change the Rules campaign. The third point I want to make is that not only do we have a strategy for the future, but our opponents have a strategy for the future. And I think workers don't realise what that strategy is and that needs to be explained in simple terms. Their strategy is to deregulate the labour market and destroy the forms of power that the trade union movement has used to win the victories we have spoken about today. And that will mean that we'll finish up like America. So they have to understand we have to defeat their strategy as part of our strategy is to defeat them. And unless workers understand that they have to fight on a number of fronts and solidarity is a critical part in building our power. Values-led strategy, unity amongst workers and the union movement and a good understanding of the strategy of the employer and hostile governments. All of these things critical to success. Sally? To you. Well, kicking on from that, I mean, as trade unionists, usually we're always in the position where we're the people with less power taking on the people with more power. If we were the people with more power, we would already have what we wanted. So usually always we're in that position. And so that's why we've got to be really good at strategy. That's why we've got to be smarter and more capable at strategy because we have to make up for that fact. And so Having a good strategy is absolutely essential in order to build hope amongst workers that it's possible to win. And without hope, people aren't going to be part of the union, a campaign of something that's happening in order to achieve it. So having a good strategy is the way that people will see, okay, I can see our situation isn't hopeless. I can see there is a way to change where we are. And I believe in this way to go about it. So as an activist, you've got to go through the strategic thinking and then we're all different, but I always have it in my head like a picture. You should be able to see how you're going to get from A to B. Then you should be able to explain that to people. And as we've talked about before, put it through the hard democratic processes because then your strategy will be better and then be able to explain it over and over and over again because that's then how people will say, okay, I believe in this, not this person, I believe in this strategy. I believe in this plan to achieve what we want to achieve. And when people have hope, they'll be prepared to take risks. 
So they'll be prepared to do things like go on strike, to make personal sacrifices, those things. But the, the basis of having that strong strategy is what builds hope. Bill, a final comment from you to conclude our discussion. Finally, life's choices are the choices you have. And you say to workers and you say to the community and you say to employers, do you want a national health care system or don't you? Do you want a national minimum wage system, which is the best that a society can provide, or, or don't you? Do you want national retirement systems with national superannuation, people making a contribution, or don't you? Do you want a national climate change policy, or don't you? Do you want an energy policy, or don't you? That is, you make people make a choice about a philosophy and about a set of policies. And as soon as people have to make the choice, as they did in terms of work choices, about a high-level minimum wage system with protections, they'll say, we want to have that system. So you make them make that philosophical choice. You then get onto the ingredients of it and the most effective way to run it. But even now, do you want a democratic society in which you have a plural society, or do you want an authoritarian society of the left, or do you want a free market society of the right. You make people say we want to be in the middle social democracy caring country. So you make them think philosophically about where they want to be, about the very big issues that count. And you make it simple. You do not make it too complex. You don't have 57 policies. You do not have 57 demands. You make it philosophically very simple for people to exercise a choice as to what sort of society they want, because that's what you actually bargain for. That's the strategy you have. That's the tactics to achieve it. Now, when you make it that sort of debate, then you don't have to have a majority at the start. Only 10 or 15% of Australians oppose the war in Vietnam at the start. They won the election in 1966 in a landslide, which was all about the approval of the war in Vietnam. But by the time 1969 had come, the very simple choice of do you want to be in Vietnam or not, that had changed. And it was very, very clear. By 72, the overwhelming number of Australians did not want to be in it. Make the choice simple and explain to them what it means in the way that their lives are run. That's what campaigning is about, but that's what strategy is about. And that's what tactics are about. They're always related to what you care for and believe in. Thank you for that. Tom, do you want to have a last say? Well, I would say to an activist, when a delegate runs into the problem of apathy, he has to have an answer. And my suggestion, the answer is, I'm opposed to apathy because apathy leads to surrender. And we should never surrender to injustice. So apathy is our enemy. Don't let injustice win because we're not prepared to fight. The second point is that when you have an argument within our movement, the approach should not be ever to fight it out on the basis of who's right. The responsibility is to fight it out on the basis of what is right for the workers. We owe that to the workers. The union movement is their movement not the leaders' movement. So we all have to take that into account. Everything we do must be done in the interest of workers and for no other purpose but the interest of the workers. My thanks to Tom, Sally and Bill. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. This podcast has stressed the importance of strategic thinking and planning to mounting effective union campaigns. It's pointed to the different roles of strategy and tactics and the need for activists to be aware of these differences. The stories told by Tom, Sally and Bill have demonstrated the extraordinary achievements possible when coherent and well-supported strategies have built the power of workers. This power has, at times, proved unstoppable. And And now a song to close by Chloe and Jason Roweth. They're drawing from their extensive repertoire of traditional and contemporary songs to bring you a powerful example of music used in support of progressive change. Over to you. Thanks, Ed. We're going back to 1969, a song of the feminist movement written by Glenn Tomasetti. It's called
called Don't Be Too Polite Girls, and it's shoring up the women's movement for um, better pay and equal rights in the workplace, saying although we've been handed some things on paper, it's not a reality when we go to work every day and we've got to keep fighting. And she's handing women the arsenal with which to do that. If Glenn's song is a song speaking to the strategy for equality in the workplace and all that that means for women and for men, then tactically she's also been very canny. She's used a great sense of humour here. She's using, again, an example of traditional music as an agent for progressive change. But this is with a laugh, with a smile. She's picked her tune well. She's picked the tune from Flash Jack from Gundagai, one of the blokiest of blokey bush songs for her wonderfully and strongly feminist song. It made me laugh the first time I heard it. This is Glenn Tomasetti's Don't Be Too Polite, Girls. Don't be too polite, girls. Don't be too polite. Show a little fight, girls. Show a little fight. Don't be fearful of offending in case you get the sack. Just recognize your value and you won't look back. Really on the way. Hooray for equal pay, girls. Hooray for equal pay. They're going to give it to most of us in spite of all their fears. And did they really need to make us wait those years? I sew shirts and trousers in the clothing trade. Since men don't do the job, I can't ask to be better paid. The people at the top really offer something more. Unless the people underneath are walking out the door. Don't be too polite, girls. Don't be too polite. Show a little fight, girls. Show a little fight. Don't be fearful of offending. In case you get the sack, just recognize your value and you won't look back. They say a man needs more to feed his children and his wife. Well, what are the needs of a woman who leads a double working life? When the whistle blows for knock-off, it's not her time for fun. She goes home to start the job that's not paid and never done. But don't be too afraid, girls, don't be too afraid. We're clearly underpaid, girls, clearly underpaid. Though equal pay in principle is every woman's right. To turn that into practice, we must show a little fight. Can't afford to pay you, say the masters in their wrath. But a woman says, just cut your coat according to the cloth. If the economy won't stand it, then here's your answer, boys. Cut out the wild extravagance on the new war toys. Oh, all among the bull girls, all among the bull. Keep your hearts full, girls, keep your hearts full. What good is a man as a doormat or following down at heel? It's not the bulls we're after, it's a fair square deal. This Masterclass series has been produced by Deliberately Engaging in support of the UN's Sustainable Development Goals to build the institutions of civil society and empower people with a greater voice. The support of the Committee to Defend Trade Union Rights and of Tony and Nina Bleasdale is gratefully acknowledged. I hope you'll join us on the next episode of this Masterclass series for Empowering Activists. I'm Ed Davis. Bye for now.